Hello, my name is Suzanne Regal and I'm the Director of Marketing and Product Manager at Analysis Corp. I'm pleased to be here and present this on-demand presentation framing benchtop NMR spectroscopy, the history, the present, and what we view for the future. So I've entitled my presentation Magnetic Resonance for All, the development of accessible NMR solutions to offer real solutions to real-world analytical problems. So benchtop NMR spectrometers have been around for a while now, so people are becoming increasingly familiar with them. Um, but I just want to start by putting the idea behind an analysis benchtop NMR into context. It's a very similar transition as the mainframe computing down to the desktop. So you've taken a, a remote, very powerful source, and you've made it smaller and more accessible to the general public. So this has increased uh, the applications of it. And if you fast forward to now, of course, computers are the mainstay in most of our work um, and personal lives. Analysis had the same vision, of course, a little bit earlier in the trajectory. So we've taken very powerful, high-field, superconducting NMR spectrometers, and we've miniaturized them by converting the magnet technology into a permanent-based magnet. This follows similar trends to all scientific instrumentation, uh, where we see a general miniaturization over time. And the idea behind that is just to make the technique more convenient and help facilitate adoption that has previously been hindered by the size, cost, complexity, and potentially even the safety of, of working around such an instrument. So the analysis itself started in 2008 based out of um, some technology licensed from Caltech where we were looking at force detected MEMS chips based NMR spectroscopy. We worked on that for about half a year. Our chief science officer, Garrett Leskowitz, suggested what might be more applicable to the public would be an NMR spectrometer that could actually fit in the glove box. So this has led to the product lines that we have now. The 60 megahertz proton only 60E was released in 2013. Multinuclear model, the 60 Pro uh, was followed a few years later. We accessorized that, turning it into an online detector for reaction monitoring, the NMR Ready Flow, an auto sampler for increased use uh, in QA, QC type applications. In 2019, we announced our higher field 100 megahertz product. We also acquired a company out of Strasbourg, France called RS2D. So this was the idea that we pair our expertise in making highly homogenous permanent magnet systems with a company that specialized in making very powerful NMR-based electronics. So a little bit more about an analysis origins um, with lab-on-a-chip type applications. So the initial work that we got started in looking at was based upon Garrett Leskowitz's PhD thesis at Caltech, looking at force-detected NMR for getting higher SNR on very small sample sizes. So a lot of Garrett's PhD thesis was done in conjunction with NASA with the idea that you could put these force detected NMR chips directly on a Mars Land Rover and be able to do NMR based analysis of rocks to determine things like age, origin, etc. So this was also paired with our director of manufacturing, Dr. Greg McFeeters, PhD work where he implemented these sensors using CMOS MEMS type technology. So we continued working on this for a while before we decided to pivot to uh, release the, the portable, accessible benchtop NMR spectrometers that we have now. So the miniaturization of benchtop NMR spectrometers by an analysis was done by one, using rare earth permanent magnets, specifically neodymium iron boron, and compiling them in a highly homogeneous compact array that we could have very limited stray field, the instruments would be very safe to be around, and we could use the minimal amount of magnetic material as required with almost no current draw. So these make cryogen-free, effectively maintenance-free instruments that can be plugged in and run on standard power anywhere that is required. And the second thing is the miniaturization of electronics. So historically, high-field NMR have had quite large electronics boxes, but we were able to condense these down into small circuit board stacks and embed a computer for data acquisition and processing although these can be controlled remotely, as I will show through the remainder of this presentation. So why was an analysis interested in doing this? Well, for a number of reasons. Um, NMR spectroscopy has remained a very stratified technique, both by end user as well as by geographical location. So this is taken from the STI Global Assessment Report in 2009, where you can see that approximately 76% of uh, use of NMR spectrometers is directly in synthetic chemistry research. So basically, they're doing basic structure elucidation to confirm starting material purity or outcome or identify things like natural products. And this is mostly an academic and government-funded type research, but you can see a lot of it in pharma, biotech, as well as contract research organizations. Industrial use is pretty limited, with agricultural and food analysis being the only one where we see a strong presence by NMR spectrometers. 
The second is the geographical distribution of NMR spectroscopy. So you can see that 35% of the worldwide representation of NMR spectrometers is in US and Canada, 32% in Europe, and they're very far away from the other countries, with only Japan and China providing a particularly strong representation. Otherwise, we can see 4% in India, 4% in Asia Pacific, 2% in Latin America, 5% the rest of the world. If we zoom on this even further, you can see that 80% of the distribution of NMR spectrometers is within eight countries worldwide. So who do we sell benchtop NMR spectrometers now? Well, not surprisingly, the early adopters of this technology were largely people who were doing sort of traditional structural elucidation type applications, but they were underserved by the nature of high field NMR spectrometers. So more specifically, this would include chemical education and then startup or sort of small and medium sized chemical synthesis companies. The future would be to develop quantitative applications that could be used for industrial type analyzers whether that be for reaction monitoring and process analytical technology or for quality analysis or quality assurance, quality control type applications through a series of different end users. As I sort of mentioned, an analysis has two main product lines, our 60 megahertz and our 100 megahertz product line. Both are neodymium type boron based magnets, so they're cryogen free. They have very limited stray field outside of the magnetic enclosures, making them easier to site and a little bit safer to be around. They require standard operating lab conditions. They can all be controlled directly through a touchscreen interface, but they both have application programmatic interfaces. So you can communicate and control the spectrometers from remote computers wherever you require. Of course, proton is the more ubiquitous of the nuclei. So we have a proton only model for people doing pretty routine analysis. And then for those who required, we also have a series of multinuclear based systems as well. They all come preloaded with a number of pretty common structural elucidation type experiments, but they have advanced programming interfaces for those people that would like to either call up more complex programs or program or optimize their own pulse programs as well. So the first underserved users that I want to discuss a little bit more in detail uh, is chemical education. So you have to do nothing but talk to uh, an instructor of undergraduate chemistry and you'll know that they immediately see the value proposition of incorporating a benchtop NMR spectrometer directly into their lab. Why is this? Well, it's because meaningful learning requires a cognitive understanding of the material, generation of sort of positive feelings associated with that material, and particularly in a physical science like chemistry, the development of the required psychomotor skills that comes from hands-on use of the equipment. However, despite being one of the most reported characterization techniques in the literature, it is true that most students do not actually get to acquire data on their own samples that they prepare. Typically, they have to prepare a sample and submit it to an auto sampler where it's run by a grad student or an NMR facilities manager, or they just get a model printout of what their spectrum should look like. So there's a lot of detachment from NMR spectroscopy, and it remains one of the more challenging techniques for students to understand. So Benchtop NMR provides a unique opportunity to include it directly within the lab, uh, whether you're teaching analytical, organic, inorganic, or biochemistry labs. But of course, low field NMR does potentially create a challenge, and that is the problem of resolution. So what do I mean by the problem of resolution? Well, we know it well. It exists in all aspects of our life. It is not limited to benchtop NMR or low field NMR spectroscopy, although it's often associated directly with that. But whether it's you don't have enough pixels to make out the game that you're playing or you're trying to titrate one eighth of a drop, this is often a common throughout chemistry. So what do I mean by managing spectral complexity? Well, here's some predicted spectra ranging from 42 up to 800 megahertz for a pretty complex molecule. And you can see at the lower field, you tend to see a little bit more blobby sort of second order. I mean, as you move to higher field, those signals become sharper and more defined as we're used to seeing for multiplicities in high field NMR spectroscopy. So how can you manage this? Well, of course, you can use heteronuclear spectroscopy. So you can use an NMR handle that typically has fewer signals per sample. So the, the spectrum itself tend to be less cluttered and they often have uh, wider sweep widths like fluorine or, or phosphorus NMR spectroscopy. You could do multiple pulse experiments, whether that be COSY, TOXY, HSQC, any of the pure shift type experiments to be able to extract the information that you require. You can add layers of software analysis where you're doing things like peak fitting, if you can make out peaks, but they're not fully resolved, indirect hard modeling to modify things that are changing throughout the course of a data acquisition, craft, quantum mechanical modeling, etc. 
You can use hyphenated techniques. So if you have a mixture, you're going to split it up and clean up your proton NMR spectra prior to data acquisition. You can apply chemometric methods like principal component analysis or partial least squares methods. You can employ machine learning techniques. But in academic teaching, those really are not the ideal way to manage these. We recently released a paper in the Journal of Chemical Education where we highlight molecules that are strategically chosen that do not show higher order couplings on 60 megahertz. So this can be very useful for um, synthetic chemistry or unknown identifications where you can select molecules based on their toxicity, their costs, and as well as their proton NMR spectrum to simplify this and circumvent any um, complexity that is added to the spectra through the use of a lower field NMR spectrometer. The second underserved market that I want to highlight is small and medium sized companies doing synthetic chemistry. This is sort of the way chemistry has been going, particularly in pharmaceutical companies, where we've seen a growth in the number of small and medium-sized companies that have sort of less than 10, 50, or 250 people. This is 96% of the chemical companies in Europe to date, and we see about 144% in the growth of chemical exported by SMEs in the United States of America. I want to highlight Spirochem, a Switzerland-based company that we've been working with for a while to really understand the requirements of this market. They have 300 uh, plus customers. They're considered a small company, but they have a global reach into 30 countries over five continents. So the problem that Spirochem is faced with is that they're a contract research organization, and to be competitive, they have to work very quickly and streamline the results that they're able to give their clients. So the majority of routine samples that are acquired are just basically proton NMR spectra that are used to assess reaction completeness, confirm the purity of a reaction, or identify product's identity. So if you think about the traditional synthetic chemistry flow, you set up your experiment, you monitor your reaction, you work up that reaction, you purify, you analyze, and then you draw conclusions. If everything went to plan, you're done there, but if it requires further optimization, of course, you continue this loop until you're happy with what your yield uh, and results look like. So typically, you want to monitor the reaction and purify. You would analyze with a number of things, whether they be TLC, GCMS, and likely NMR spectroscopy. But if you're a small to medium-sized company, it's hard to justify purchasing a high-field NMR spectrometer. Typically, an entry-level high-field NMR costs about $250,000. Um, it costs about $110 per year to maintain that in the technician that is required to maintain that salary, as well as cryogens, power consumption, etc. But you get data quickly, so you can use the data frequently throughout the course of your synthetic chemistry workflow, but it's pretty hard to justify this if you don't have enough chemists that are using the NMR spectrometer. So in that case, you're faced with the requirement to outsource to an NMR facility. So prices change depending on how close they are to you and how busy the NMR um, facilities are. But let's say on average for standard service, you're paying about $50 for proton NMR and between $250 to $500 for a carbon NMR and typically require about one week to get your data back. For priority services, let's say you're almost double the cost, but you can receive your data within 24 hours. So for someone like a contract research organization, which needs to iterate quickly, it's just not suitable to be waiting that long to make decisions. So benchtop NMR spectroscopy offers a really nice sort of intermediate to allow you to incorporate more NMR spectroscopy directly into your workflow for things like monitoring your reactions, assessing the purity, and maybe even verifying uh, products that you make all the time. And then you can still outsource to samples when you need to be sure to provide an analysis report to customers. So for this group, we wanted to release a higher power based NMR spectrometer. We started by working on a 90 megahertz instrument and realized that we would like to push it to the theoretical maximum of about 100 megahertz. So why would we do that? Here I've shown sort of the benchmark molecule for benchtop NMR of ibuprofen. So in green on the top there, you could see the 60 megahertz. I've zoomed into it there and you can see that the methine peak itself is not resolved, it runs directly into the signal and you can't fully integrate it. Whereas 100, that peak is well resolved and you can fully make out each individual resonance. So this helps provide a little bit more information, but also it does help address problems of the spectral complexity that I mentioned before. So here's an example of an agrochemical diphenate run at both 60 and 100 megahertz. 
And you could see if I wanted to report the chemical shifts of this, for 60 megahertz, I would have four separate multiplets of which I cannot extract any connectivity information from trying to visually analyze the spectrum itself. As I move to 100, I still can't fully make out the aromatic peaks. I still have some complex heteronuclear type coupling in the middle as well, but I can start to see visually things that start to make sense to me. So uh, triplets, doublets of triplets, doublets of quartets, and I can extract the important things of the multiplicity and the chemical shifts. But even more important is that 100 megahertz provides us enough information that we can apply data software analysis tools. So this is an example of NMR Solutions quantum mechanical modeling. Um, you could see we have our diphenate in the sample that's sort of labeled with what every molecule is. Um, you can see in my spectrum, blue is the actual, red is the predicted, green is the error that is associated with it. And you can see I no longer have multiplets. The 100 megahertz data is sufficiently well resolved that I'm able to extract all the required coupling constants and confirm that basic structure. This is an excellent example of how you can use this. It's done by Guido Pauli in Chicago, where he uses NMR solutions to take information uh, about complex peptide chains and determine their primary, secondary, and tertiary structure by using this quantum mechanical modeling and extrapolating it down to low field NMR spectroscopy. Okay, so how do we want to proliferate the use of benchtop NMR into applications where historically it has been largely excluded? Well, this is sort of a three pronged approach. One is through technological innovation, where we productize the NMR spectrometer to specifically address the requirements of a market, whether that be performance-based, robustness, the sampling method, the connectivity, etc. We also focus on method development. So that's sort of a vague term, but refers to the use of pulse programming, signal processing, data analysis tools to extract the required information. And then finally, application validation to ensure that the product that we've assessed for the market and the methods that we've developed provide users with analytical solutions. So an example of productization would be what we call a React. So in initial uh, research-based models, we used our standard 60 megahertz NMR spectrometer. And instead of using a static NMR tube that you would normally see, uh, we were able to outfit it with an online reaction cell that we could flow the sample either in and out through the top or in through the bottom and out through the top to be able to monitor reactions in real time. So I have two examples shown here, one at BASF using traditional batch type chemistry where we required a lot of temperature insulation between the sample from the reaction and the magnet to ensure that we can get good quality NMR data throughout. And an example from Fraunhofer IMM using the more modern flow type chemistry where we're able to use the NMR through self-optimization. You can see in both of these pictures, the machine are not be controlled directly by the instrument themselves but rather through the application programmatic interface, we're interacting with these through remote computers to ensure that we can control temperature, pressure, flow rate, sampling rate, etc., of all the different components of these reactions together. So productization requires increased temperature and pressure ranges, control of the instrument through an external base system. So in addition to the productization of the NMR spectrometers, we also look to do method validation for a number of different types of applications where NMR spectrometers have not been traditionally used. These have a number of different varieties, and I'm going to show you four case studies here that range from traditional NMR spectroscopic methods like structure elucidation to QNMR, whether that be through absolute quantification or through internal type standards. So the quantum unifying factor here is we need to make sure that the benchtop answer is repeated reliably every time that we look at the answer and that it can be run by non-experts in NMR spectroscopy. The first being in a, what we would call an illicit drug analyzer. So instead of requiring experts who can look at the NMR spectrometer and extract the useful information, the idea would be that it would be fully automated such that technicians or forensic scientists would be able to use the instrument. So this is a pretty traditional structure elucidation type method for the police. The problem for law enforcement officers is that targeted methods, traditionally like GCMS or HPLC, require standards. So they're largely blind to all designer-based drugs where you maybe only modified one position, but they're no longer aligned with what you know. So the idea is that benchtop NMR can be paired with databases for rapid on-site identification of drugs and the potentially flagging something that has the same structural scaffold as a known drug, but isn't already known to law enforcement agencies. And then moreover, uh, we want to be able to put it directly on a mobile lab van such that it can go directly to site. 
So it requires accurate and reliable information. Um, it requires stability. It has to be easily mounted and requires very minimal power consumption and, of course, automation. So here's one example where we've taken a, a street drug, applied it to a database and be able to extrapolate the amount of illicit drug as well as what the uh, fillers it's been added to it. My second case study would be a crude oil analyzer. So this was done in conjunction with our collaborators in Sardinia called Sartec, where they used our computer's application programmatic interface to be able to put together their own application for technicians at a refinery. So the problem that they face is that incoming crude stocks have different chemical compositions, and this needs to be assessed before refining to maintain the productivity of the refinery and ensure that you're processing the incoming feedstocks as is required. So to do this, we paired benchtop NMR spectroscopy with machine learning for rapid on-site analysis of both the crudes and the residue. Why is this valuable? Well, traditionally, offline testing can require up to two weeks. So this drastically decreases the productivity and invokes a large cost for storage of the oils while you wait to find out how to do it. So what have we been able to do? We've been able to look at several different metrics and combine them with just one proton NMR spectrometer to yield all of the required information. A third case study would be a traditional quantitative application, and that is cannabinoid content analyzer. So this can be done with the use of an internal standard or a relative composition, depending on what exactly that you're looking for. Of course, cannabis analysis is increasing as it's becoming increasingly decriminalized and or legalized in a number of different jurisdictions and THC and CBD are typically the ones that are most important to uh, producers and consumers. So we're using our API and an easy software interface to do automatic analysis of THC and CBD from extracts from oils or from extracts from buds or trim. The value of this over HPLC is one is it's an orthogonal technique, so you're able to compare directly to ensure that you're getting accurate corroboratable results. Two, it requires a simple sample preparation. It has reduced operating expenditures relative to liquid chromatography. The results are accurate and rapid, and it's completely automatable. The fourth case study is a non-traditional uh, QNMR-based type application, and where we're making an automated database such that technicians in mining facilities are able to determine the lithium content in brine using NMR spectroscopy. We all know that lithium is becoming increasingly important within our society for largely battery-based applications. Traditionally, atomic absorption and ICP are the methods that are used to determine brine content, but they typically require cumbersome sample preps and are pretty prone to showing matrix effects whereby other cations mask the lithium response itself. Additionally, AA and ICP spectrometers are typically pretty hard uh, to maintain. So the idea being that the NMR based could use lithium-7 for rapid on-site analysis. So again, just like the previous examples, very simple sample preparation. You can use the brine directly into an NMR tube. Um, reduced operating expenditures doesn't require heat or sampling methods. Then you can get accurate results where the data integrity is maintained and can be audited whenever is required. So in addition to our 60 and 100 megahertz platform that I've showed you and the use cases that we're using it for and where we're trying to grow the market by method validation and application validation, Analysis also purchased RS2D in 2020. Primarily, we were looking to incorporate the very powerful Chameleon 4 or CAM4 technology as the same platform to power the entire range of magnetic resonance platforms, time domain, low field NMR, high field NMR, as well as MRI. And so we've developed a series of products from replacement consoles to DNP polarization type molecules, MRI consoles, et cetera, all based on the same platform. The idea being that we can create a seamless transition of data analysis for customers where you're able to go through the whole range of get all your answers in one simple platform. So in conclusion, I hope I've showed you the future of Compact NMR lies in focused responsiveness of technological innovations paired with method validation and application validation to develop high ROI-based applications. So thank you very much for your attention. I want to thank these people at Analysis, SpiroChem, NMR Solutions, BASF and Fraunhofer for the development and, and initial work for process analytical technologies, the LKA Nider Saxon for their help in developing this illicit drug database, 
Sartec for the development of machine learning methods to analyze a series of compositions of crude oils, SNN Labs for their expertise in THC and CBD analysis, SQM for their expertise in lithium mining, and the folks at RS2D for the development and incorporation for integration of the CAMFOR into their technology. Thank you very much. Obviously, this is not a live platform, so I can't take any questions here, but please don't hesitate to reach out if you have any. We would love to discuss the applications of Benchtop NMR with you further. Okay, thank you for your attention.